just look at me and just tell me. Similarly hard. Oh, really? In Arabic or what? Ok, alors maintenant vous allez être live, vous allez être en direct avec tout le monde. Alors maintenant tout le monde peut vous voir. Is she typing though or I don't get it? Can she hear me? Can Saf, vous pouvez nous entendre? Alors, votre traductrice est là et le modérateur de la session. Il va commencer et après il va te introduire et vous pouvez faire, pouvez faire okay. votre discours. On va, on va, on va lire ça par écrit. Oui, uh, vous êtes live sur l'écran dans l'auditorium et uh, le, le chair de, de la session va, va commencer. Okay. Bonjour Rensaf, uh, merci de nous... Uh, Bonjour. Merci uh, d'être ici. Super, vous êtes sur l'écran maintenant, alors uh, on va commencer bientôt. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, being here uh, at, at this very important event. Um, I've heard there was a, a string of, uh, of great panel discussions and great speakers, and uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, these kinds of events, of course, are very important, um, uh, very important topics, especially considering um, the main discussion out there uh, these days in the mainstream media is usually dominated by political rhetoric and not uh, by discussions about topics pertinent to the future of our world. So, uh, especially in the present political climate, I think, uh, these uh, kinds of events are more important than ever. So thank you very much for being here. And thank you to everybody who is watching uh, at home on live stream. This mic is very short. So I'll be leaning over <laughs> like this the whole time. Unless you can hear me like this. Can you hear me like this? Is that, is that okay? Okay, so I, I have to, okay. No problem. It's all right. I just worked out for the first time in six months, and I can hardly move anyway. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, of course, uh, the, the topic of this discussion um, will be uh, related to political prisoners, specifically pursuing justice for political prisoners, um, which, of course, uh, is an eternal struggle. Um, some very important figures are here uh, related to that struggle, and I'll introduce them, uh, at which point they'll address you all for 12 to 15 minutes uh, each, and then we'll go ahead with uh, the panel discussion, questions from the audience, so, so think about some questions, and, um, and that'll last for another 20 to 25 minutes. So again, thank you for being here. As you can see, um, Ensef Hedar is, joins us via Skype. Um, for those of you who don't know, she is a Saudi Arabian Canadian human rights activist. She is the wife of Raif Badawi, uh, who of course was arrested in 2012 on a charge of insulting Islam uh, through electronic channels. He's a, a blogger and he was brought to court on several charges uh, in Saudi Arabia, if uh, I didn't already mention that. Later sentenced to 10 years in jail and 1,000 lashes. Uh, she is also the president co-founder of the Raif Badawi Foundation for Freedom. We're also joined by Kate Barth, who is the legal director of Freedom Now. Uh, Kate Barth is Freedom Now's uh, legal director, as I mentioned, where she represents individual prisoners of conscience before international human rights tribunals and conducts political and public relations advocacy campaigns to press governments for the release of Freedom Now's clients. Uh, prior to joining Freedom Now, she was a legal officer with Lawyers Collective in New Delhi, India, where she worked on the mandate of the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to health and manage the global health and human rights database. Uh, Mireille El Chakar was supposed to be here, but she's not, so I'll, I'll skip <laughs> that one. And of course, Professor Erwin Kotler uh, joins us. Uh, many of you already know, of course, who Professor Erwin Kotler is, honorary chairman, uh, founder, and chair of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, an emeritus professor of law at McGill University, former member of parliament, former minister of justice and attorney general of Canada and an international human rights lawyer, Professor Kotler, uh, intervene in landmark charter of rights cases in the areas of free speech, freedom of religion, minority rights, peace law, and war crimes justice. So we're accompanied by um, some very notable individuals. And uh, we are also accompanied by Amina, who will be, uh, Amani, sorry, I apologize. Amani, who will be, who will be translating for, for NSAF. So, uh, without further ado, perhaps uh, peut-être qu'on va commencer avec uh, Madame Haidar Ensaf. Uh, si, uh, uh, si, vous, si vous voulez commencer, uh, n'importe quand. Ensaf, est-ce que vous m'entendez? 
Oui. 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 Alors, euh, alors les, gens, les, les gens vous entendent. Euh, alors, vous pouvez commencer, si vous voulez. Uh, bonjour à tout le monde. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to be among you in, the more, in, the important, in this important meeting. Freedom of expression is the air that is inhaled by every free thinker. It is a spark of the ignorance, the flame of ideas, and all form of creativity. During the past ages, people were only able to develop and innovate thanks to freedom of thought and expression. Freedom of expression does not tell us what is right and what is wrong. However, it teaches us to listen to everyone except all ideas, even those who, who we disagree with. This was my husband's message, to write his words freely and defend the rights of others to do so. <laughs> My husband, Zraif Badawi, who was in prison five years ago, was accused of thinking. I bring you his message, the message of my three children, who were only deprived of their father because he exercised his natural right to express his opinion. زوجي رائف بدوي المزجوم منذ خمس سنوات بتهمة التفكير أحمل إليكم رسالته وهي رسالة أطفالي الثلاثة الذين حرموا من أبيهم لا لشيء إلا لأنه مارس حقها الطبيعي في التعبير عن الرأي أحمل إليكم رسالة أمل بأن أرى يوما ما زوجي رائف بدوي يقف بينكم من هذا المنبر ليقص عليكم قصة سجنه ومحنته وأسرته I bring, you, I bring you a message of hope that one day I will see my husband, Raif Badawi, standing among you on this, on this podium and telling you the story of his imprisonment, his, tri his tribulation, and his family. At the same time, I bring you a message of insistence, the insistence of a Saudi woman who is standing before you now and telling you that peaceful change is possible in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. However, it is only attainable through you, through you and with your help. The same insistence of Raif Badawi that is telling you that peaceful expressions of opinion is a human right that must never be compromised, and it is, a, it is the right of all human beings without exception. Indeed, I talked about Raif a lot, and I still do. I recount his sufferings in, my, in many places and on different events. This has always been possible thanks to people like you. Five years have passed as if they were five centuries. The clock in my home has lost its hands since Raif was arrested. A part of us all lies in prison and our suffering increases day by day. However, we have, a lot, we have not lost hope yet. I have said a lot, and I do not think that there is anything else that, I, that, that you do not know about our case. But in short, I would like to tell you that Raif's case is not a case of an individual. It is a social case, a state case, a case of homeland. Raif Badawi has carried the case of his homeland in his heart.
ولا أن كلماتي خرجت من صميم قلبي من قناعاتي في إمكانية التغيير السلمي كانت كلماتي مرعبة لمن يستفيد من بقاء الوضع الراهن. He expressed this concern with his, with his pen and, word, and his words in ink on paper. ولا أن كلماتي خرجت من صميم قلبه من قناعاتي بإمكانه بإمكانية التغيير السلمي كانت كلماتي مرعبة لمن يستفيد من بقاء الوضع الراهن. And because his words came out of uh, came out from the bottom of his heart, from his conviction conviction of the possibility of peaceful cha peaceful change, his words were terrifying to those who benefit from keeping the st status quo. التغيير لن يحدث طالما تركنا الخوف يكمم أفواهنا. التغيير لن يحدث لو ظل الصمت منهجنا. يوما ما سيتوجب علي على وطن الحبيب أن يلتزم بالقوانين والمعاهدات الدولية لحقوق الإنسان. Change will not happen as long as we let fear seals our lips. Change will not happen if silence remains our doctrine. One day, my beloved country will have to abide by international human rights law and treaties. لأن يوم إطلاق سراح رائف سيكون يوما عظيما للحرية يكون عيدا لكل أنصار الحرية عبر العالم شكرا لكم This dream will come true I believe in that just as I am sure that one day Raif Badawi will stand among you here in this podium only then I will have the right to rejoice because Raif's release day will, will be a great day of freedom it will be a celebration for all supporters of free, freedom across the world thank you very much Thank you very much, uh, Ensaf, for those very moving words. Merci beaucoup, uh, Ensaf, pour, uh, pour, uh, pour les mots. Um, and now we'll hear from uh, Maître Kate Barth. I'm not sure how to move the microphone here. Is it on? Great. Is it better I speak at the podium or? No, you can speak there. Okay. Um, okay, so thanks to all of you for coming today. It's really my pleasure to be able to speak with you about these very important issues. As Paul mentioned earlier, I am the legal director of Freedom Now, which is an NGO that works to free political prisoners through targeted legal, political, and PR advocacy. Um, today I want to talk to you guys a little bit about how you go about pursuing the first step of achieving justice for political prisoners. Now. I do think that achieving justice for political prisoners is about more than simply securing release, which is basically what I'm going to focus on today. In fact, I would argue that where a person has been detained because he or she has exercised a fundamental human right, usually freedom of speech, really justice has only been obtained once that person is able to enjoy the ability to freely exercise that right in the future, which obviously requires fairly large-scale systemic change. But securing release is the first step, and because most political prisoners represent some kind of threat to a government, when you're able to secure their release, you really restore a leader for justice or a voice of reason or peace back to the community. Um, so it can help in sort of that larger goal of effectuating systemic change. So prisoners of conscience uh, largely exist outside of a smoothly functioning justice system, obviously, right? Or else they wouldn't have been convicted. That means that obtaining their release requires working through a combination of supranational mechanisms, legal courts, political pressure, and PR campaigns. Now, different countries are going to react differently to different kinds of pressure. Some will take an adverse decision from an international legal court quite to heart. Um, others really care about staying in the good graces of certain political actors. And still others really care about their international reputation. So usually when Freedom Now takes on a new client, the first thing that we do is we kind of all put our heads together and come up with like a holistic strategy for how we are going to try to get our clients out of prison. Uh, first, we'll identify points of leverage in a particular country. These might be things like, you know, where they get their foreign assistance funds from, if there's a particular trade treaty or something like that that the country wants signed. Um, we also will consider who our potential allies are. 
Uh, these might be other governments in the region that have an interest in seeing uh, a more democratic neighbor. Um, these could be particular Western countries that have a certain connection with the target government. These might be, you know, other NGOs or foreign aid agencies. And then we're going to sequence the actions. So usually, but not always, we will start with legal. Um, now, it is true, and this is almost always the first question I get at these kinds of events, that international or a judgment from an international human rights court is very rarely enforceable in the same way that a domestic judgment is. But that doesn't mean that it's not a particularly powerful tool. It is. So even though I can't take, for example, an opinion that might come from the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention and kind of, you know, wave it in front of some Chinese bailiff and then hear the sweet sound of the lock turning in the key, I can use that judgment effectively as proof perfect that what the government has done is wrong and that it's internationally recognized as wrong and that my client has been arbitrarily detained. Um, so, for example, whenever I'm going to meet with embassy staff or an ambassador, I will always bring a copy of the relevant judgment with me as this kind of proof perfect. Um, and it's just one kind of fun example. A couple of months ago, I was uh, chatting with an ambassador from a country that had detained a client. And he was just kind of like mansplaining all over the place to me how I didn't understand the security context in his country. And in such context, you know, a person that is writing these pro-democracy articles is really giving aid to the terrorists. And it was just so delicious to be able to reach into my bag and pull out this international judgment and kind of lay it on the table between us and say, with all due respect, sir, whether or not your government agrees that my client has been arbitrarily detained, the rest of the world thinks he has been. So at the very least, you have an international reputational issue on your hands, and let's talk about how we can help work through that, namely by releasing my client. Um, so these legal judgments do have a particular power in that sense, and they're often useful uh, as sort of the backbone of the PR and the political advocacy that is to come, which is why we usually start there. Um, of course, once you've decided to start with legal, that does open up a whole subset of other strategic questions about what courts to go to and why. Um, so take the case, for example, of Khadija Ismailova, who is a fantastic Azerbaijani journalist who reported on the corruption of the presidential family and in 2014 was sentenced to seven years in prison. Now, Azerbaijan is signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights. It's signatory to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So her lawyers could have taken her case to the European Court on Human Rights, to the Human Rights Committee, which is the body that oversees complaints under the ICCPR. Azerbaijan is also a member of the UN, so they could have taken her complaint to the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, which is a body of experts that sits at the UN level, which is empowered to issue opinions on arbitrary detention. Even UNESCO has a human rights procedure which is available for people like artists and journalists, which Khadija was. So there's really a question of where you're going to take this case. And the answer to that question really depends on strategic considerations. For example, how long will it take, more or less, for a case to work its way through this legal mechanism? And you know, what is the potential strength of enforcement? What is the government's history of regard for decisions being issued from this legal mechanism? And even what is your personal relationship with the gatekeepers for this court? Now, this last thing, the relationship issue, is obviously not something that should be the case in law. Um, but in international law, unfortunately, relationships sometimes matter. Um, international courts, by and large, are not very transparent. Um, they don't have clear rules of procedure, and often the courts are underfunded and understaffed. So how quickly your case gets heard and how kept in the loop you are can sometimes depend on whether you or your organization have um, open lines of communication with the staff of a particular court. And I could go on and on and on and on about how frustrating this is, but in an effort not to use up all my time kvetching about this, um, let me move on to political advocacy. Um, which is also something very potent. 
you know, usually a country will care less about a particular dissident than it does about its own geopolitical concerns and kind of ticking off the wrong entity. So maybe that entity is the USA, which tends to carry a fairly big stick in foreign policy. Um, maybe it's a country in the surrounding region, maybe it's international aid agency. But the idea is that if you can find ways to move this political lever, it is quite powerful. Now, because Freedom Now started in DC, much of our advocacy is uh, traditionally US-based. Um, for better or worse, the US is a fairly political, powerful political actor, although it may be interesting to see how this changes um, over the next couple of years. And obviously the means of applying political pressure are quite varied, and they can encompass anything from having a politician make a particularly well-directed phone call to having a couple of members of Congress or Parliament sign onto a chastising letter to the president of the target government. Maybe you get a staff briefing or a congressional hearing. Um, since Trump has become president, we've even seen uh, a few presidential tweets on political prisoners, which is a new one. Um, but hey, whatever works, I guess. Um, and there's really three, or what I would consider three kind of mainstays to conducting an effective political advocacy campaign. First of all, again, it can be fairly relationship-based. So at Freedom Now, we certainly have uh, particular congressional or Senate offices that we know we have a good relationship with. And if I pick up a new client in, say, Vietnam, I know exactly who I can get on the phone to help uh, bolster further support. Um, secondly, you really want to be able to build a fairly broad coalition with other people or groups that also care about political prisoners. There are a lot of groups out there that do work on these, and everyone has their own strength. Uh, Amnesty International is a name I'm sure most of you have heard. They certainly have the best listserv in the business, so if you're going to be organizing a protest, you definitely want them on board. Uh, Human Rights Watch has really terrific researchers, so they're great for you know, getting good information. The idea is you want to be able to build up and use on each other's strengths. And the third real mainstay of a political campaign is understanding that these things take time and that you're going to have to apply constant pressure over a longer period of time. Um, you know, it's Rome wasn't built in a day or, or freed with a phone call, I'd say. So then we come to PR pressure, uh, which can sometimes be the most potent. If you can really get people to pay attention and care about your client, there's a good chance that the target government is going to sit up and take notice. This, for example, is why it's always really great to have a celebrity name check your client. Um, as just one kind of fun example, uh, Freedom Now had Amal Clooney as co-counsel for one of our clients, uh, president or former president of the Maldives, Mohammed Nasheed. And uh, she went to go visit him in the Maldives in prison, accompanied by a whole slew of paparazzi. And, you know, there was a spread in People magazine the next week, which, you know, is usually not a magazine that cares that much about political prisoner issues um, that was talking about our client. And that kind of attention is really, really great. That client was, in fact, um, allowed to leave the country shortly thereafter. Uh, but even, in, you know, if you don't have a celebrity or a Mal Clooney on the case, that's okay. Um, really, a PR campaign is about creating a compelling and truthful narrative that will personalize your client to many people. Uh, for example, a couple months ago, um, I had some recently released clients who were Mauritanian anti-slavery activists um, come visit DC. They had just been awarded the Hero Award by uh, Secretary of State Kerry at the time. Um, so we did a little advocacy tour with them on Capitol Hill. And I can pretty much promise you that so many frontline human rights defenders feel so passionately about their work that if you get them 20 minutes alone with a senator or a congressman, the only thing they want to talk about is the importance of freedom and the dignity of man, which is really true, but also incredibly boring to talk about for 20 minutes. Um, it doesn't make for a very compelling narrative just to talk about how important freedom is, right? So I had to work with these clients to really come up with a storyline that was more of a hook. Uh, one of these clients himself had actually been born into slavery. So the eventual storyline that he <clears throat> 
or that we worked on and, and he pitched to people was basically, I was born into slavery, I worked as a slave for 20 years, it was really awful, although you know, by the grace of education and in his case, the US government, I was able to free myself. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of people in Mauritania in this situation, and here, Senator, are the three things that I would like you to do about it. That is a much more compelling storyline to be able to sell to a senator or to the New York Times or any kind of PR pitch than simply people should be free. So if you're able to combine legal pressure, political advocacy, and PR campaigns together, you can really put a naughty government in the hot seat. One of the things that does make this kind of work so difficult, however, is that you can conduct the you know, perfect campaign and still not see any relief. Uh, this happens often. Um, and for advocates, it can feel a little bit like you're running a long marathon with no finish. And I, I can only imagine what it must feel like for the families and, and the political prisoner, him or herself. Um, I will say, though, without minimizing the very real suffering that an arbitrarily detained person must endure while imprisoned, that I do think there is something fairly important and justice accomplishing about even making these efforts. Uh, whenever I'm on an initial phone call with the family, kind of walking them through our process, I am very clear uh, that we can't promise release. Um, most often, however, the response that I get from the family is that just doing this kind of work is bringing them some hope that may make the prisoner's time a little easier to bear. And I think that if you speak with a released prisoner, um, he or she will tell you that they were in some way sustained by the knowledge that there were people on the outside bearing witness and making noise about their injustice. Knowing that an international legal body has confirmed the arbitrariness of your detention or that a PR campaign is bringing world recognition to the injustice done to you. Basically just knowing that the world is aware that you have been wronged and that there are people actively working to right that wrong is in a way, if not justice, at least some kind of satisfaction and accountability. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Professor Kotler. Thank you, Paul. I'm delighted to be here as part of this uh, panel with uh, Ensa Pater, a very courageous uh, woman. And you have to understand the uh, pain and plight not only of the political prisoner, in this case her husband, the imprisoned Saudi blogger, blogger Raif Badawi, but the pain and for the family as a whole. Uh, Ensa Pater and her three children are living here as refugees uh, in uh, Cherbourg, Quebec, and we're now approaching the fifth year of his imprisonment for doing nothing other than, uh, as Ensaf put it, exercising freedom of expression. And if I may borrow from a metaphor that she used, but as part of a Supreme Court judgment in the Switzerman case on the, the importance of freedom of expression, I said, liberty in these things is a little less important to man than breathing is uh, to our physical uh, existence, and for that uh, he was uh, criminalized. I'm delighted also to be here uh, with, with Kate Barth, who's been an exemplary legal uh, director, and you've witnessed uh, now her, her advocacy, and happy with uh, ha Paul here as a, a moderator for this uh, discussion. And indeed, when we speak about uh, political prisoners in this instance, we're speaking about the importance and compelability of pursuing justice for political prisoners and the corresponding accountability for the uh, human rights uh, violators. Uh, earlier I was asked uh, by someone uh, and asked me even to share, you know, how did you get involved with uh, defending uh, political prisoners, something that I've been doing now for 45 years. And while this doesn't appear in the CV, uh, it's perhaps the most important uh, impact that I had, which was uh, the teachings of, of my parents. It was my father who taught me uh, before I could even understand the profundity of the message, but which bears directly on the theme of this conference when he put it to me that the pursuit of justice was equal to all the other commandments combined. But then it was my mother who in 
she would hear my father saying this, would say to me that if you want to pursue justice, you have to understand, you have to feel the injustice about you. You have to go in and about your people and beyond and feel the injustice and combat the injustice. And I suspect as a result of the teachings of my parents and other uh, mentors who were significant in my life, like Eloise Zell, I got involved in the two most important uh, human rights struggles of the second half of the 20th century. The struggle for human rights in the former Soviet Union and the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. And got involved in the context of those struggles with the two political prisoners who reflected and represented the identity, uh, the vision, uh, the compelability of those struggles, namely uh, political prisoner Anatoly Sharansky, then in the former Soviet Union, and Nelson Mandela in South Africa. And as an example of not only appreciating the plight and pain of those struggles through the looking glass of the political prisoners, we should appreciate the importance of freeing political prisoners in that Anatoly Sharansky and the Helsinki rights monitors with whom uh, he was working brought about, and there was a song written uh, to this as well, that a small group brought about, in effect, uh, the dissolution of the former uh, Soviet Union. To use a Marxist metaphor, if I may borrow it, the withering away of the uh, Soviet state. And similarly, Nelson Mandela demonstrated how one person could endure 27 years in a South African prison and emerge to not only become, uh, to preside over the dismantling of apartheid, but to become president of the first democratic, non-racial, egalitarian South Africa. So I mention these two cases because we have to appreciate that when we're talking about pursuing justice for political prisoners, we are talking about transformative justice possibilities. If we can free somebody like Raif Badawi with his vision for Saudi Arabia, that can have a transformative impact in his uh, state and society as well. So what I'd like to do now is, is two things. First, share with you the experience to the extent that I have been able to appreciate it, the experience of what is it to be a political prisoner? What, is the, what are the patterns of prosecution and persecution that are endured by uh, political prisoners? And then secondly, what are the remedies, and I'll link up with what uh, Kate was mentioning, in terms of trying to free these political prisoners. Let me begin first with the patterns of persecution and, and prosecution, also of torture and injustice endured by political prisoners, which include, to begin with, the criminalization <coughs> of innocence, where people are imprisoned not for what they do, but for who they are, reminding us of the old Soviet dictum Give us the prisoner and we will find the crime. Second, arbitrary arrest and detention, where, for example, the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, as mentioned by Kate, has documented these patterns of arbitrariness and uh, detention and did so in the case, among others, of uh, Raif uh, Badawi, as has the uh, United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Iran, Ahmed Shahid, who appeared before our Parliamentary Committee on uh, Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Human Rights on a number of occasions, documented the patterns of arbitrary arrest and detention of political prisoners uh, in, in Iran. A third is what might be called the criminalization of fundamental freedoms, freedoms that we take uh, for granted, such as freedom of opinion and expression, freedom of conscience and uh, be belief, and which particularly find expression in their violations in the patterns of persecution and prosecution of these political prisoners. And Raif Badawi, and you heard this from Ensef Adder, is a dramatic case study of this criminalization 
of fundamental freedoms. And we have to appreciate that as we meet, there has been for the past number of years a intensification of uh, authoritarian regimes. In other words, we are seeing an intensification of authoritarianism, for example, in China, in Russia, in Iran, in Turkey, in Venezuela. And the intensification of this insurgent authoritarianism has also resulted in more persecutions and prosecutions of those political prisoners. And when that is compounded with a democracy recession, or a democracy appears in retreat, then you have less effective advocacy on the one hand to free them as there is more imprisonment, prosecution and persecution taking place. A fourth and moving more quickly is the phenomenon of torture in detention. Raif Badawi is one of those victims of the torture and detention. Almost every political prisoner, in fact I would say every political prisoner that I have represented has been the victim of torture in uh, detention. Something we may not always uh, fully appreciate but is fully documented. The fifth thing is the persistent and pervasive assault on the legal rights of these political prisoners. Things that we would normally, again, uh, take for granted, but which are under constant assault. I'm referring here of the denial of the right to a fair hearing, the denial of the right to counsel, the denial of the presumption of innocence to begin with, the denial of the right to bodily integrity. I can go on. You have an ongoing succession of violations of fundamental legal rights that we might take uh, for granted. This brings me to the sixth uh, part of the patterns of persecution and prosecution. This leads to an unlawful conviction based on false, if not absurd and trumped up charges such as corruption on earth, which is part of the uh, prosecutorial indictments with regard to political prisoners in Iran uh, commonly, or uh, insulting government authorities, which would be part of uh, prosecutions and persecutions in other uh, resurgent authoritarian uh, states such as uh, Turkey or Saudi Arabia. A seventh uh, pattern of the persecution is the targeted extrajudicial executions under cover of law. You find this particularly in Iran, where there are more executions per capita than any other country in the world, and where in the first three months of 2017, which has gone almost unnoticed, unacknowledged, and unaddressed, we've had close to 240 executions in the first three months of 2017 alone, and again, as I say, not only with an absence of redress, but really with an absence of notice and acknowledgement. A next uh, pattern is the patterns of intimidation, harassment, and abuse of family uh, members, or of the human rights defenders who would defend them. I don't know how many people know that Raif Badawi's lawyer in Saudi Arabia was himself sentenced to 15 years of imprisonment for simply defending Raif Badawi under uh, law. And this holds true in other of those countries uh, that, that I've mentioned. The ninth is that we always have to appreciate that political prisoners are very often living within a sphere of state-sanctioned cultures of repression and authoritarianism. And finally, there is this culture of impunity in these countries. Not only are people not brought to justice, but in fact, those who imprison these political prisoners are even rewarded for their acts of uh, persecution and prosecution. Let me just say that as we meet, the present uh, Minister of Justice in Iran, Mustafa Pur Muhammadi, is the person responsible for the murder of thousands of dissidents in the 1988 massacres in Iran. And he today presides over, as Minister of Justice, engaged also in those uh, pronouncements and extrajudicial executions to which I was referring. And so the question then becomes, uh, what then 
uh, do we do? And I want to share very briefly part of an advocacy model developed over my 45 years involvement, but which began actually in the first involvements uh, that I had, which were in the cases of uh, Sharansky and Mandela. Uh, to the extent uh, that they've been refined since, I owe to uh, people with whom I've been working, like Jared Genzer, who founded Freedom Now, one of the, uh, uh, I think, best uh, young lawyers that I know in the, in the world today, with whom I've had the opportunity uh, to work together with. But the models began, and let me just uh, state with regard to uh, Sharansky for a moment. The first thing was, in fact, to <coughs> make representations to the human rights violator country to begin with. In other words, to take them as seriously as they purport to take themselves with regard to their legal system. In fact, the Soviet Union had one of the best constitutions for human rights in the world. And so our brief did not rely on Canadian law or American law or European law. We basically said that the Soviet Union was violating their own law in every particular, both procedurally and substantively. And so it was here using, as Andrei Sakharov, the father of the dissident movement in the former Soviet Union used to say, the mobilization of shame against the human rights violator country by exposing and unmasking the violation of their own uh, legal system, which we sought to do uh, recently in a brief with regard to Raif uh, Badawi in that regard. The second thing is to invoke the good offices, the voice and action of one's own host country. Let me give you a case study of how this uh, can work. Uh, during the course of representing uh, Sharansky, uh, we were fortunate to get the support and advocacy of the then Prime Minister at the time, Pierre Elliott uh, Trudeau, uh, government ministers and the like. But when Sharansky was released, and he was released after some eight and a half years of imprisonment, it happened within one year of Gorbachev becoming the president of the Soviet Union. And I always was wondering, what role did Gorbachev have uh, in the release of Sharansky? And at a certain uh, point, we were on a panel uh, uh, together uh, in the early 90s, and I asked him the question, exactly that. What role did he have in the, the release of Sharansky? And he answered me in translation, but I, I thought the answer was fascinating in terms of us appreciating the nature of advocacy and where one's own country can play a role, both by being part of that advocacy or if they are not part of the advocacy. And Gorbachev's answer was as follows. He said, you know, the first trip I made outside the Soviet Union, I did so as a Secretary of Agriculture. He said, and I came to Canada in 1984. He said, uh, you may not believe this, but because uh, Sharansky had been first uh, arrested and uh, imprisoned and sentenced in 19." Uh, 78 on both the charges of uh, treason and anti-Soviet slander and agitation. So when Gorbachev comes, Sharansky's already uh, been in prison for seven and a half years. But he said to me, I know he was a household word in Canada. You, know, you have to believe me. He says, I never heard of Sharansky in the Soviet Union. I was a secretary of agriculture. I came to Canada. I went before your parliamentary uh, committee on agriculture. He said, and after a few questions on agriculture, they started to ask me questions about this guy, Sharansky. I didn't really know who they were talking about. I left the parliament buildings and there was a, a massive demonstration for this guy Sharansky. He said, I then spent the weekend as a guest of your minister of agriculture, Eugene Whalen. And yes, we talked about agriculture, but he kept talking to me about this guy Sharansky. He said, so later on when I became president of the Soviet Union, I ordered up his file. Who is this uh, Sharansky that everybody is talking about that wherever I went in my a trip in Canada, I was bumping into a, a, a demonstration, a representation about the Sharansky. He said, I look, he said, yes, he was a troublemaker. He said, but he wasn't really a criminal. And then he made the important statement. He said, but it was costing us to keep him in prison. It was costing us politically. It was costing us in economically. It was costing us in terms of our image. It was costing us in terms of our standing. In and out. So I ordered his release in our self interest. In other words, when you make representations for the release of political prisoners, you have to bear in mind that the human rights violator countries are unlikely to release them 
on matters of justice or humanity, which are the basis of the legal briefs we make nonetheless. But you have to bring them to the tipping point where they realize that it's in their self-interest to release the political prisoner. I'm not going to take any more time, uh, just one-liners, the other remedies we learned about, Kate mentioned, the internationalization of advocacy. You have to build up a critical mass of advocacy engaging uh, other uh, countries, uh, parliaments, uh, intergovernmental organizations and the like. Pursue justice and accountability through the various panoply of remedies in the UN system, such as the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, and it can work and uh, Kate has mentioned it. International courts and tribunals, engaging civil society. Civil society can provide a critical mass of advocacy. When we were involved at that time with the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, struggle for human rights in the Soviet Union, we had women for Soviet jury, women against apartheid uh, in uh, South Africa, artists, scientists, I can, parliamentarians, I can go build up a critical mass of advocacy. And so I'll close just by saying, and this is something we should all uh, appreciate here, that it's our responsibility, each one of us in this room, if we want to get somebody like Raif Badawi freed, to speak on behalf of those who cannot be heard, to join <coughs> Ensab Hadar in bearing witness on behalf of those like Raif who cannot themselves testify, to act on behalf of those like Raif Badawi have put not only their livelihood, but indeed their lives on the line. It's our responsibility then to ensure that these political prisoners also, while they are in prison, know that they are not alone, that we are standing in solidarity with them, that we will not relent in our advocacy until they are in fact released to serve not only the pursuit of justice and accountability, but frankly, the self-interest of the violating country. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kotler. <clears throat> All of you now have um, the, the privilege of, uh, of asking uh, questions uh, to our panel, should you choose. Uh, so while you think of it, while you head down to the mics, um, I guess I'll start things off. Uh, Amani, uh, if you could come back up here. We're going to get uh, NSAF back into the conversation. Um, and I'll, just, I'll ask the question first, then you can, you can translate it. Uh, and Safa, on va demander une question pour, uh, pour vous. Um, so uh, we were talking about the general <laughs> role of, uh, you know, of civil society and, and, and what foreign governments can do to, to put pressure uh, as far as it goes to, uh, as far as releasing prisoners go. But we haven't really touched on Canada so much. Uh, so I want to ask NSAF, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, you know, has taken a cautious approach as far as pressuring the Saudi government uh, goes. I just want to ask you very simply, has the Canadian government uh, done enough to help your husband? Uh, بصراحة إلى الآن يعني ما في ولا أي جديد وهذه المشكلة إنه إلى الآن يعني أنا أنتظر إنه يكون في 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 جديد يكون في أي أي معلومات عن متغير عن الأول لكن للأسف يعني إلى الآن لا زلنا مثل ما إحنا ما في أي تغيير أتمنى من ميسي جستون إنه يفعل أي شيء عشان رايف إحنا الآن هنا مقيمين في كندا في كيبيك أتمنى إنه ميسي جستون يعمل أكثر من من بقية الدول اللي اللي, اللي تحكي عن قضية رايف. Okay, so um, till this, till now, there has been no changes. I hope, uh, I hope that there will be. I, we're now living in Quebec, and I, we're hoping that Trudeau will hear us and make a changement into our case because till now there has been no changement, no, no more info, no more details. Everything has been has stayed the same and hasn't changed. Um, maybe uh, Professor Cutler, I just wanted to before we get to the audience, to sort of to play off that. Um, I had a chance to speak to Mohammed Fahmi, and he, he was calling for, he believes um, if Canada had a legislation or a protection charter, um, so a, a standardized protocol, 
for how a government or even a prime minister ought to act in situations like these. Do you, do you think that's something that Canada lacks, a uh, standardized protocol? Yes, I, I do think it's something Canada lacks. And in fact, uh, as a, when I was an MP, I proposed uh, such a private member's bill that would set, a, uh, set forth a protocol uh, for what governments must do on behalf of, you know, uh, political prisoners, particularly when those political prisoners are citizens or permanent residents of Canada and the like. But I'll tell you an interesting exchange with regard uh, with Justin Trudeau that I think Ensa uh, knows about as, as well. Uh, I went to meet with the Prime Minister uh, with regard uh, to Raif Badawi's uh, case and another case, Leopoldo Lopez uh, in Venezuela. And uh, I began by saying, uh, you know, uh, I was sitting in this exact office, in this exact chair, 36 years ago. I said when I was accompanied by the then wife of Avital uh, Sharansky when we met uh, with your father. I said, and Avital Sharansky was a very bright and, and, and very effective, and I said, uh, and perhaps it helped us as well, a very uh, compelling and attractive woman. And uh, we met with your father, and I presented him a legal brief with respect to uh, Sharansky's case. And the brief happened to be 700 pages, and I <laughs> gave it to uh, Pierre Le Trudeau, and I asked him if he would make representations to the Soviet Union on our behalf, and he took the brief, and I still remember, and he said, he looked at me and he said, okay, Kotler, uh, I like the idea of a legal approach. I'll take this home, and I'll read it over the weekend. If it's good, you'll have my support Monday morning. If it's lousy, I'll kick your ass in for wasting my weekend. So at that point, Justin Trudeau said to me, so what happened? I said, well, fortunately, uh, on, on Monday, he gave us his support and made direct representations to the Soviet Union. I said, I'm not saying that that led to Sharansky's release. I'm saying by not making those representations, it would have hurt the case and cause for Sharansky's release. And I'm saying the same thing with Raif Badawi. I'm not saying your intervention will bring about his release. I'm saying the absence of your intervention will hurt the case and cause for his release. Um, just state your name and the question. Uh, this question is for Professor Kotler. I know around the world there are many countries that practice administrative detention. I'd like you to comment on the 6,000 Palestinians that are imprisoned in Israel on administrative detention. Okay, well, you've mentioned um, that many countries in the world and, uh, that practice administrative uh, detention, and uh, the, those include uh, most of the uh, democracies that uh, do so. Uh, I have appeared before Israeli courts in the matter of uh, those under administrative detention, uh, including, I remember, going back in 1977, uh, Tasir al-Aruri was a Palestinian uh, detainee at the time, but what I have found is that uh, I'm opposed to administrative detention, so it wherever it occurs, um, although there uh, may be required um, in certain matters of apprehension of terrorist threats, and even our own uh, laws authorize that. The question is really whether, uh, number one, uh, the detainee uh, has access uh, for, uh, to a legal uh, defense. In this case, uh, the Palestinian detainee had not only access to a lawyer there, but in fact, I was able to make representations as well. Two, uh, whether there is uh, judicial oversight, and there is mandatory uh, judicial oversight with respect to administrative detainees in Israel. And number three, whether the detainee in, the, in, the, in administrative detention is protected against uh, any form of uh, harassment, abuse, uh, let alone, God forbid, uh, torture. And in that regard, uh, there has been serious oversight uh, to ensure that administrative detainees are protected against any acts of torture. <coughs> Uh, yes, thank you very much for your discussions. <coughs> Maître Kotler and Maître Barth, to speak to lawyers the way they're spoken to here, you have a separate title for them the way you have a title for doctor. And I hope that that is universalized to give lawyers the respect they deserve. 
Uh, these cases that you've spoken of by Freedom Now and Professor Kaller, whom everybody knows around the world for his work on human rights in Israel and every place where there's injustice, speak to unjust detention and either illegal laws, laws that violate human rights or that are applied in indiscriminate and unjust ways, people who are falsely uh, imprisoned and sometimes tortured. What about issues that are somewhat different? What about issues where crimes occur and because public authorities are involved, they are not appropriately prosecuted and the victims just continue and exist, but the cr so, do, so do the perpetrators and the crimes go, um, not that they're unreported, but after they're reported, the file is shelved. This would include um, um, sort of uh, abuse, I would say um, malfeasance on the part of the police who refuse to investigate a crime. And uh, one of the procedures that could be used to prevent uh, the investigations of crime from happening would be, say, mislabeling a file, labeling files as trivial so that they can't be entered into the prosecutor's <laughs> database. And that occurs in more than one country that you might think of, and I have a lot of information on these issues. And my name is, and this is the first time we were asked to name her, so my name is Roberta Ann Kapelovich. I happen to know that the police departments in Quebec do this. So I'd like to ask you whether you also look at cases of crimes that do not go prosecuted as part of your dockets. Um, I can respond for freedom now. Uh, we don't. Our mandate limits us to dealing with prisoners of conscience and issues of arbitrary detention, and there's a lot of terrible things out there that don't fall into that category. I mean, as just one example, we tend not to have that many cases from Latin America because culturally, Latin American countries tend to kill their dissidents instead of imprisoning them, which is a terrible thing. But I do want to address what you're, you're talking about, basically this culture of impunity, right? And as Professor Cutlow mentioned, this is a real issue, and this is certainly an issue in many countries, not just the ones where, you know, Freedom Now or uh, Professor Kotler have clients. It's difficult to uh, contend against a culture of impunity within the country itself because obviously we don't really have the ability to force a local police department to suddenly start holding its members accountable. There are certain ways that the international community or different governments have tried to be a little more perpetrator focused. And just one example, in the US uh, a couple months ago, I think it was December, uh, they passed something called the Global Magnitsky Act. The Global Magnitsky Act uh, allows the US government to put a uh, travel ban and an asset ban on individuals that have committed certain grotesque acts like torture um, or enforced disappearance. That again, that's gonna be uh, much more of a stick if we're talking about some you know, high level official that actually has assets in the US or likes to travel to Mar-a-Lago to you know, hang out on the beach there or something. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the people that are actually doing the torturing tend to be sort of the more mid-level um, officials. So there is some question about, you know, in practice, how effective that is going to be at punishing the perpetrators. But I definitely commend those kinds of uh, acts by the international community or different states um, to be a little more perpetrator-focused perpetrator in order to crack down on this culture of impunity. Okay, uh, just to uh, link up with where uh, Kate uh, left off. Uh, we are talking about the uh, culture of impunity. And uh, to give you an example of how this all comes together with political prisoners, last October, we brought uh, three uh, political families of political prisoners, one of them, Ensa Tata, to Ottawa to meet with parliamentarians, to meet with the Women's uh, Caucus and the like. And we want to we want to do not only shine a spotlight on the pain and plight of the political prisoners, but also on the impunity uh, that surrounded it because that same month, uh, the countries that were imprisoning uh, these political prisoners were up for election to the UN Human Rights Council. So that's on the international level where we sought to combat the culture of impunity. For example, Saudi Arabia was up for election and was elected to the UN. Human Rights Council. China was up for election and was elected to the UN uh, Human Rights Council. Fortunately and surprisingly but happily, Russia was uh, defeated as part of this international campaign. So that's with international political prisoners, culture of impunity. The second thing is what uh, was mentioned uh, also by Kate and that's the global justice uh, 
for Sergei Magnitsky legislation. Um, I introduced that as a parliamentarian uh, before I retired. As we are meeting uh, next week, uh, the Canadian Parliament is going to be reporting uh, on uh, one of the bills that I proposed that came into this parliament, uh, a global justice for Sergei Magnitsky legislation. It's called here Global Human Rights Accountability Act. And what this means is where you have, as in a country like Russia, a culture of criminality, a culture of corruption, and a culture of impunity, and the country like Russia won't do anything about it or even rewards uh, the violated, at least we in Canada, as the United States has done, will not permit entry to those violators, will not permit them to launder their proceeds here in Canada, will not permit them, in fact, to uh, leverage their proceeds of crime and abuse our uh, citizenry, our security, our economy. Now, now to get to the more specific thing of what happens with domestic uh, crimes here where there appears to be a culture of impunity. Like Kate, this has not been part of my mandate, but there are approaches here, and that is one has to make representations and invoke uh, civilian oversight boards with regard uh, to police uh, parliamentary processes, depending on whether the issue is federal or provincial for a review and oversight uh, by parliament, uh, judicial review processes, ombudsperson uh, reviews, etc. There are a panoply of remedies to try to combat this, and let's face it, in a democracy, you can at least combat the culture of impunity, whereas in the other authoritarian countries I mentioned, if you try to do it in that country, you'll probably end up being imprisoned yourself. I just have one point to make on that, is that issues of Quebec of provincial jurisdiction do not take away uh, a Canadian citizen's charter rights. Even if I live in Quebec, I still have my Canadian charter rights, and it is up to the Attorney General of Canada to enforce those rights the same way uh, federal U.S. law enforcement agencies escorted children into a school in Little Rock to, uh, to desegregate schools. There's nothing more local than a school in a school board, and it was federal uh, law enforcement agents who escorted those children back into the school. It is also the responsibility of the Attorney General of Canada to enforce the charter rights of Canadian citizens, irrespective of Quebec jurisdiction. I promise you, that's very important. Thank you very much. Sir? Am I on? Yes. Yeah. I, I'd like to take a moment to thank Mrs. Badawi for spending the afternoon with us. Um, I have a lot of respect for what you're doing. I understand the strength and courage that it takes for you to be working at this while you're suffering the pain. She thanks you and wants you to guys know that she is very thankful for you guys to invite, uh, have invited her and that she hopes that you all leave today with uh, the need and want to make a change and help others and help her husband so she can see her, like he can see his kids and his wife. Yeah. I, I, I read your husband's book um, about a year ago. It, um, it touched me deeply. Um, it's inspired some of the work that I'm doing. And um, I need you to know that I'll do everything I can on my side to get people involved, to get myself involved. قال أنا حيسوي إلي يقدر عليه عشان يقدر يساعدكم لأنه مرة يعني كان حساس لما قرأ كتاب زوجي. ألف شكر. She says thank you. شكرا. Thank you very much, sir. And I, I mean, you got a question for Professor uh, Cobb. So my question is for the, well, actually for both of you. Um, the case of uh, Raif uh, is not, um, it's a case that's happening, I guess, a lot, but we just don't know it. But um, the thing is that she, they are here as refugees. And my question is, 
how can we expect the Canadian government to help her to get her husband out if our government itself once did it with Abdullah al-Malki's case, which is him um, being captured in Syria and taken away for absolutely no reasons, and then when he really got released, keep in mind he had physical damage, psychological damage, he um, got released, but till this day no one has apologized, and all of this happened under the Stephen Harper um, regime, uh, I mean, uh, case, um, when he was in charge. So how can we help a person that's going through that with another government if our government isn't doing so? Also, uh, just to add to that, let's not forget um, Canada's military dealings with Saudi Arabia right, and selling weaponry to the country as well. Well, yeah, I mean, you should never underestimate a government's ability to be hypocritical when it's in their interest to do so. Um, but that doesn't mean that they still can't help. Um, to take a step back, yes, where a country is not talking the, or walking the walk but talking the talk, it makes it more difficult. Um, I think in the U.S. we're about to see some interesting shifts in our advocacy because for a very long time the U.S. has been a fairly you know, forceful voice for things like freeing political prisoners and freedom of the press, and that's very different difficult to square when you now have the president kind of making attacks on domestic press as well. And we are expecting that to have some damaging effect to the U.S.'s ability to be taken seriously, effectively, by these countries that it, it's lecturing. But I do think it's worth keeping in mind that when we talk about the government, we shouldn't be talking about it as if it's a unified force, right? There's a lot of different people and a lot of different institutions and a lot of different departments that make up a government. So it might be that you won't necessarily have the force of the Canadian foreign ministry behind you when you're making the plea for, you know, Badawi or anyone else's release because they recognize they don't really have clean hands with respect to other political prisoners. But that doesn't mean that you can't get, you know, a number of parliamentarians to sign on to a letter saying, hey, we're not cool with this, and you should know that. Um, the other thing is when you're talking about strategic relationships, that are based on non-human rights uh, fundamentals like security. One way to look at that is that it makes it more difficult. Another way to look at that is that it makes it a little easier because Canada can say, listen, you know, we have this relationship with you based on particular security concerns and we would like, as part of that conversation, to also talk about XYZ political prisoner. I mean, and, the, and getting the government to do that is really a matter of being particularly persuasive with whoever you're meeting with. And maybe you need to call a couple of parliamentarians or congressmen to get them to talk to the State Department to make that pitch. Okay, so I just want to add something. I'm not really concentrated on the fact that to release someone, I'm more concentrated on the fact that how can we want to really help release someone out of, in another country, another government, if we ourselves took someone and put him away and never told him why, never apologized, and afterwards, yeah, we did change and we had Justin Trudeau as a prime minister, but when, let's say, again, Abdullah Malki's case, he um, got his lawyers and they sent letters asking at least for an apology, not even the reasoning, but an apology, yet they never answered, and actually they didn't answer and said that they're not willing to apologize because they don't want to bring the case back again, and for it to maybe ruin their image. So uh, it's, again, as you said, it's a little bit hypocritical because they want to help, they are trying maybe, have the intentions of helping someone to get them out, yet they themselves don't want to apologize for putting someone in jail and torturing them as well. So I want to know. Yeah. I, I know the case, I, I also was involved as a, you know, counsel for Meher Arar, who also suffered uh, torture in, in Syria, and that took a while, but uh, you know, we set up a commission of inquiry to look into what happened with regard to Meher Arar, uh, which made uh, determinations as to his torture, and finally the government did apologize and make a compensation, uh, etc. Then uh, Justice Frank Iacobucci, with whom I recently uh, spoke, did come down and uh, you know, vindicated Al-Maki and the others with regard to what had happened uh, in Syria in their case as well, and well, whereas they've come to a settlement, the question of a, an apology has not yet been forthcoming, but it may uh, well be. Uh, bringing it now back to the case of uh, Ensef Hadar, I just want to say that because of her uh, courage and advocacy, um, I can 
say that with regard to representations made on behalf of uh, Raif Badawi, the Foreign Affairs Committee on which I sat unanimously called for the release of Raif Badawi. The Canadian Parliament as a whole, which is not usual, uh, unanimously adopted a motion calling for his release. Uh, I don't think I ever had a meeting with the former Foreign Minister Stefan Dion in which uh, Raif Badawi's case was not uh, a central theme. And as Stefan told me that he had met with the King of Saudi Arabia, uh, regrettably it did not lead uh, to uh, Badawi's release as yet. And that's why I want to echo the call of Ensaf Hadar that we, we need citizen advocacy as well. Uh, citizen advocacy at least to our MPs, to our ministers, etc., to keep the case, you know, uh, insistent in its advocacy here in Canada and uh, towards uh, Saudi uh, Arabia and at the uh, highest levels. One of the first meeting I had with Christia Freeland, who's our new foreign minister, I brought up the case of uh, Raif Badawi. I believe that if we keep on with this relentless approach to advocacy, as I said, that's what we have to do with regard to political prisoners, then Raif Badawi will be released because Saudi Arabia will realize at a certain point, at a certain tipping point, that it's in their self-interest to do so. And Canada should at least be able, among other things, to leverage the $13 billion arms sale to Saudi Arabia, which I opposed, as a matter of fact, in Parliament, to leverage that for purposes of helping to bring about uh, Badawi's release. And I just want to close by saying, because I want to recognize uh, Brandon Silver, who works uh, with us in the Ra Raoul Wallenberg Center. He alone organized a campaign. It was about a, a three-week campaign, which produced 1,300,000 signatures to a petition to release uh, Raif Badawi in December. He ran it all by himself, and that was the result internationally. And there's an example of what one person can do in organizing a campaign. 1,300,000 signatures, less than three weeks to uh, release Badawi. It shows that Raif Badawi is on the radar screen. We just have to intensify our advocacy to ensure his release. Uh, last question. I think Mr. Uh, Cutler has addressed it somewhat, but just maybe to end on a more concrete and somewhat positive if possible note. So first of all, thank you to Ms. Badawi for being here and sharing uh, her story. But I think uh, my question is more on both an individual level, a legal level, a society level, what can be done today to, to, to support the freedom of Rafi Badawi. So I, uh, somebody mentioned that you were able to organize a campaign to get it, a million uh, a little bit over a million signatures. There are a few people left in this room. Can we get it to five million? Is there something concrete that can be done? Uh, Monday morning, can we write 10 letters to MPs? Like very concretely, is there action that people in the room can support as organizations working in different human rights issues? So we write uh, emails to our members, asking them to make phone calls to their MPs. So on a very, very concrete level, uh, I would like to hear both from Ms. Badawi and from the girl wants to ask if there is something we can do, something constant, we can do something so we can do something to help them, to help Raif to get out of the decision. Is it a petition to write a letter to the Prime Minister or anything? Actually, it's something that we can do. We can do something to help them. أتوقع تقدم للرئيس جوستون إنه أن الأوان إنه يعمل شيء عشان رايف إنما شيء معين يعني أقدر أقول إننا نقدر نعمله إلى الآن ما في في ماجيك ممكن إننا نعمل بس أتمنى منهم إنهم يستمروا. She said that at the moment there. Isn't something precise that you can do, but all we can do together as uh, like uh, United is to constantly send emails to our prime ministers, or the people in charge in the government, constantly sending 
letters to people <laughs> all over the world and even the Canadian government here and to send them letters saying that we want him out and be very political, be very lawful, like put some laws in so it can, uh, it can help him uh, get released and also constantly talk about the situation that's happening so people, so it doesn't die and it constantly is reminded and people know what's going on. She wants it to be a case that is remembered so when he comes out, people will know that, oh, he, this is what happened to him and now he's out, so, yeah. I think that uh, Ensel Potter has given us the marching orders. Uh, this is the marching orders for citizen advocacy. We are coming up to the fifth anniversary of Raif Badawi's imprisonment. And so we should use the occasion of this commemorative uh, anniversary to call and create a critical mass of advocacy for his release from the prime minister to the foreign minister uh, to Parliament and the like. Uh, I'm not aware that in this new Parliament there have been as yet uh, unanimous calls for Badawi's release. I think that the upcoming fifth anniversary is an occasion uh, for that, as it is to press uh, the Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister, etc., to make direct representations uh, to Saudi Arabia calling for his release. We need representations at the highest level with a sense of urgency because we have to take account of uh, matters of health, etc. as he approaches his fifth year of imprisonment. But I believe that, uh, as Ensaf said, if we can build a critical mass of advocacy, and we went to Washington uh, together actually last year, almost a year ago today, where we met then with senators and Congress people, and it was on the eve of President Obama's trip to Saudi Arabia, where we called on uh, President Obama to, in fact, bring up uh, the case of Raif Badawi when in uh, Saudi Arabia. And this is the idea here, that we have to make representations to our government and parliament, but we also have to internationalize uh, the advocacy so that if that critical mass, critical mass of advocacy is created, as well as critical mass of citizen advocacy, hopefully we can bring about his release and we have the courageous Ensaf Hatter uh, working day and night and I believe with her involvement that will happen. Can I just add one sure, thing on this? I, it's not actually not that relevant to Badawi's case, but when it comes to citizen advocacy, we also always appreciate and encourage people to do things like, for example, write to the government of Vietnam and say, hey, I was planning on taking a vacation to Vietnam, but then I heard about Mr. John Doe that you kept locked up and now I'm not going. Stuff like that is helpful just to let the, you know, the government know and you can always, you know, just contact the local embassy um, that these client stories are getting out there and they are becoming somewhat costly for the government. Obviously, when you, you do that, you want to make sure that you don't have any family members in the country at the time. <laughs> Um, so, you know, be, be clever about it. But stuff like that is also helpful. All right, thank you very much. I want to give uh, perhaps the last word to uh, NSAF. Of course, we're talking about Raif Badawi throughout this whole uh, panel discussion. Um, but I just want to, to end on, 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 on this. Um, NSAF, what can you tell us? What's the latest on Raif's uh, condition in prison right now? صراحة جدا سيء نفسيا وصحيا دائما أنا أعيد أن وضعه جدا سيء لأنه أكيد السجن مش سهل وبالذات سجن الإنسان يعني كل مشكلته أنه بس عبر عن رأيه فوضعه نفسيا جدا سيء بعيد عن أولاده أولاده الآن كبروا صار له خمس سنين بعيد عن أولاده سيء بالمقبل she said that his uh, his mental state is very not okay. He's physically not okay. He's in pain and mentally he's devastated that he's away from his kids and his wife and that his kids have grown since it's been five years. He um, he feels depressed and not okay. obviously it's not okay. She said that jail is not easy, especially the fact that over there they are torturing him because he shared his opinion as well as the fact that um, he's constantly being tortured for 
just saying what he felt like and being in jail, uh, people around him aren't treating him right because they feel like he is the one who um, ruined it for himself. So they think that he's in, she, she says that he, he's in pain and especially mentally, he's extremely not okay. يبغى يعرف إذا عندك أي شيء ثاني تبغى تقولي قبل ما نقفل الموضوع. آه بدي بس أشكر الجميع وأشكركم على إنكم استضفتوني وإنكم لازلتم آه آه تعملوا من أجل قضية رايف أشكر آه دكتور كوتلر ألف 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 شكر آه شكرا لكم جميعا. She'd like to thank you all for having her, for listening to her, and for asking questions and actually care about the situation. As well, she would like to thank Dr. I forgot your name. But. Yes. 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 Sorry, I was going to say something else, but okay. So she wants to thank you, and uh, also she would like to thank you guys for being supportive, and she hopes, she sees hope in all of us, and especially for the questions that we've asked. She sees hope that we will make a change and hopefully continue the case and not let the case die and actually uh, want to support her and her kids and her husband so she her, her, her kids can see her their father again. So she thanks Some you. From she says, thank you so much. And thank you for uh, being here as well. And uh, thanks to our panelists. And have a good afternoon. Um, in about five minutes, we're just going to refresh ourselves and then we'll head into the final closing ceremony. Thanks.